Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, produced by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Titus Walker. Titus is the CEO of the organization called the Ultimate Endgamers League. Welcome, Titus. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Titus, tell me a little bit about how you came up with the name The Ultimate Endgamers League. Well, um, we wanted to create something different. Um, and we were creating kind of like the, the UFC of gaming. And so we needed a term that we thought was similar to like mixed martial arts. So we created the word Endgamer. And the end gamer came from basically when you when you've beaten a game, you reach the end game and it unlocks all of the potential within that game. So basically, once you've mastered the game, you unlock all of the potential in that game, all of the, you know, extras, if, if, you, if you will, uh, the weapons and stuff like that. So um, the end gamer was is, is the master of gaming. So once you've mastered gaming completely, you become an end gamer. Um, and so you can, you know, compete in any type of game, whether it's a fighting game, sports, shooting, racing, or strategy game. Uh, and that's that's the term, master of, the, uh, uh, of gaming, is the end gamer. Okay, so you must have liked winning when you were young and had the passion to win quite a bit to be able to explain that. And tell us a little bit about your journey. Where'd you start? What were your roots like? Um, so I started gaming when I was like four years old. Um, and... Uh, had a, a a great upbringing up until about eight years old. Um, I had uh, some stuff with the family and, and uh, my father actually ended up and my mother actually ended up uh, going to prison for something that um, they didn't do. Uh, and, and but um, but uh, so it, it kind of changed my outlook on life and, and made me become more, um, I, I think, community focused. But it was more around the community of my family because keeping we had a, I had a huge family. I mean, we had five siblings, uh, I had five siblings and two later. So total of uh, seven of us. And so it was trying to uh, make sure to keep everybody um, engaged and, and having a good time. And so I spent a lot of time creating different games and different stuff. And we weren't very wealthy, of course, we were extremely poor. Um, and so trying to make sure that everybody was entertained without a lot of the things that we wanted to keep ourselves entertained. Um, and like I said, until I was about eight, we had pretty much everything we could want, um, uh, at least as a kid anyways, you know. So hmm. um, so then from there on, it was more like trying to, to make fun out of things. And, uh, and so I think that that's really where um, the ability to create uh, came from, that creativity of just creating a game out of nothing. You have sticks and, you know, maybe a trash can or uh, something like that. And, and you build out an entire system around that. Um, and so I got really good at that. So the gaming was also a form of entertainment mm -hmm. where you could kind of uh, control the family, we'll say, guide the yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. Where did you come from? Where, where were you originally born and raised? So I was born in uh, Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and um, raised in, I, we moved to Southern Maryland after um, that uh, situation. So we essentially, I grew up in like the Southern uh, Maryland, like Lusby, Solomon's Island area. Um, up until I was about 18 when I moved out and bought a house in Virginia and lived there ever since. And tell us how that helped you when you started your business, the, uh, the, the ultimate end gamer league, the importance of forming a community. Yeah. Um, well, fast forward from that, I got into real estate for about eight years. I did, um, real estate development, so I didn't have like a license in real estate, but I would develop communities from a uh, plot of land and, and uh, did everything from a 10 home community all the way up to a 2000 home community. And um, so in doing that, I uh, learned how to position and how to make sure that you had something for a customer because we had to have the right loan products and the right marketing and the right house types and the right, you know, uh, uh, amenities and 
And so positioning and marketing became something I was really good at and building community became something I was really good at. Um, and so this kind of, as, as weird as it sounds, that was more the transition into gaming than anything. It was like real estate became, it, it kind of just made sense. I loved gaming since I was a kid. Um, and I got into the gaming world and saw it was a little bit broken in, in a sense of community. Like it, it has community, but it's all fractured. Like you have your fighting game community, your sports game community, shooting game community. Um, and so trying to combine all of them and create one community just made the most sense to me. Not only does it give you, you know, the larger market, um, but on top of that, it allows you to uh, bring everybody together and, and create something that everybody can enjoy. So what is the essence of the community that you built? What's the fabric that brings everybody together uh, in your organization? I think the language of gaming. I think uh, gaming is, is even even though it's kind of been fractured for marketing purposes, like it makes sense if you're, you're the developer of a game, you only want people playing your game. And so you're going to try and push people to become fanatics for your game. But I think that um, every game is, is kind of the same. When you think about it, it's just different graphics, but the controller's all the same. Has, you know, there's only but so many buttons on a controller, only so many um, you know things on a keyboard. So it's it's all the same. It's just utilizing digital skills within, uh, or with utilizing skills within a digital environment. And so um, that language kind of you know, a, a, even though people don't really talk about it this way, unless you're you're an in gamer, um, you know, fighting games are very similar. It's it's pattern recognition, it's button memorization, it's um, understanding like you know uh, uh, button layout, spatial awareness. That type of stuff also translates into shooting games and fighting games and sports games. And so finding a way to kind of com combine all of those things really just, I think, makes sense for um, kind of bringing everybody together. And that becomes that fabric of the community. So let's say that that's the infrastructure of your business. You've got the technology behind it, the gamers, everybody's experience. But the spirit of the community comes about. It lives, it breathes, it changes. Tell us how you create that community and the emotions and the spirit behind it that keeps people coming back for more and more, and it turns into a lifestyle. Man, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, I believe everything is, is really like a top down type thing where, you know, if the, the head of the uh, ship, if you will, is uh, welcoming and open to new ideas and, and new concepts than everybody else is too. And um, I've always been the type of person that just, um, I believe everybody has something to offer. Uh, it may not be something that you need or that you want, but in the world, like, you know, if you understand that, that, you know, everyone has something to offer, then you kind of open up to a lot of different ideas and that becomes the fabric of how everybody else operates um, within your community. And so that has blossomed into this like thing that, that this, this, this industry, this business that, I mean, we have a, a massive team. I mean, it, it's massive, um, not including the players, right? Just the people that are helping run the organization. And they're all, you know, diehard, amazing people that are, um, that are doing it for the love of gaming. And I think that, stems from that you know idea that everybody has something to offer you know um and so yeah i think that i think that pretty much answers the question <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the team that you built yeah how did the right people come at the right time how did you identify them how did you know they were actually the people and how did you incorporate their mindset their enthusiasm and passion to help build and feed off each other man uh so that is a, a tough question to answer because how did they, I think without, I, I got to give God the credit on this because like there were so many situations where um, there's a lot of the wrong people that show up, right? With the wrong intentions. And um, I think I've been given a, the, the ability to, to navigate that pretty well and see, I, I can see the potential in people, but I can also recognize when they don't want to live up to that potential. And um, as much as you want them to live up to it, they don't want to. And so we've had a lot of those um, where you want to bring people along and, and they just don't want to come along. And that's fine. But so so cutting them off early is is very important in, in keeping the, the, the team together. But also um, being able to help people uh, recognize their own potential. 
is important. And so when I'm bringing people in, I think that a lot of those people see themselves a certain way and constantly feeding them the way that I see them, but also teaching them how to be that person. Um, and I think I, I've had, I mean, I'm still young, but I have a lot, I've had a lot of life experience to where I really find myself able to coach and help people uh, reach their potential. And, uh, and so that's become kind of a, it's always been, you know, my dream to create an opportunity, but also help people um, live in that opportunity and that potential. And so um, that's just something that I've, I've, I don't know, I've just been able to blossom in that the people get sent to me and, you know, my, my right hand man, my COO uh, of the company um, 300 is what we call him. This is, this is gamer tag, but um, 300 comes in and he, I didn't know this at the time, but he was running, you know, the pipelines uh, that were going uh, for the for the gas lines, and he he managed the entire security for for those pipelines. So he had a you know five million dollar security business. I had no idea. I just thought he was a gamer. He comes in like every other gamer, right? Um, and uh, when uh, a lot of stuff happened with uh, COVID and stuff, and so his uh, firm got basically shut down, and and they weren't able to operate for that period of time. And so he comes in, you know. I didn't know he's, he, but he's like depressed at the time and, and um, struggling with, you know, the fact that he has this, you know, $5 million business that he's now not able to do anything with because of COVID. And um, he comes in and he immediately recognizes what we're doing and, and, um, and starts helping and just starts putting everything together and aligning the pieces and setting everything up and stuff that he had learned in his previous business. But he was, okay with not being the head guy he didn't want to be the head guy anymore he was like i've done that i don't want to do that i want i but he saw the vision and, and i remember him you know pulling me aside and saying hey you know you have a unicorn right and i was like okay what, is, what do you mean like you know and he's like you know every now and then a business comes around that it's 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 a multi-billion dollar business and you have that like you just you have an idea that it's a multi-billion dollar idea i just i don't know if you know that and I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I believe that. And, and, you know, since then, he, he just he just took over. I mean, we, we, we have, you know, Monday meetings, Tuesday meetings, Wednesday meetings with all of the different teams that we work with. We have a, a production wing. We have a technology wing. We have an education wing. We have a collegiate wing. We have, you know, all these different uh, uh, on top of the professional side and the esports side and sales. We have a sales team. We have it's just it's so wild. Um a lot of that came from him and he walks through the door, you know, it just, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really make sense. And I, that's, the, I guess the only way to explain it. You mentioned just a moment ago, having the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. I call it the art of the hard conversation because <laughs> they are hard. They're not easy. Yeah. yeah. Let's take the individual you just named 300. Mm -hmm. How does 300 have those hard conversations he keeps everybody together and keeps everything flowing the way it needs to with the enthusiasm and speed that you need. So me and 300, we play good cop, bad cop. and He makes me play it. I don't want to play it, but he's bad cop <laughs> and everybody knows it. Um, you know, if you have to talk to 300, you are very nervous. If you have to talk to me, you're, you're happy, you know, but um, I'm really good at the bad conversation at, at the hard conversation because I, when I, by the time I'm having that hard conversation with you, I know that I have done everything in my power and in people around me's power to get you to the potential that you know, and I know, and we can both agree on, you can get there. Like you have that potential. And so once we get to that point, it is at this, it's just business. It's no longer personal, right? Like, um, and that's kind of how, how I look at things. I don't know if they see it that same way, but we have found that a lot of the people that do leave end up coming back and they, you know, they, they see kind of their, the error of their ways, if they, if you will, some of them don't, right. Some of them never will. And, and that's fine. Um, it's not for everybody, but if 300 is the one having that conversation with you, then it is very, he is the type of person that will tell you exactly, exactly how it is, whether you see it or not. Um, and so, uh, and he has no, no, you know, Fear. It is strictly business with him. There is no emotion in it um, whatsoever. And I think that that works beautifully because um, he sees a lot of things that I don't and I see a lot of things that he doesn't. And we complement each other really well. And, and we have the, the hard conversations with each other often. We hold each other accountable, um, you know, and we argue all the time. And, and I remember the first argument we ever had. Um, 
And I'm so used to like, to argue and having an issue for a long period of time or whatever, right? We had this, I mean, heated, heated argument about something he did not agree with me on, on moving forward with the league and, you know, whatever. It was the first one we ever had. And um, he wasn't COO at the time, but he, we were, we, I mean, we were going at it and it ends and he says, okay, we'll do it that way. And then he was, and then he goes on to the next topic as if nothing ever happened. And I'm like, maybe he's like holding on to this or maybe it's like internalized or maybe no. I don't even think he remembers the conversation that we have or the, or the argument that we had. And I've told him this before. It was the wildest. Uh, and that was when I knew, like, I need this guy. Like, he is willing to go toe to toe with me, you know, on something that, you know, he wasn't even a part of. Right. And um, and he was willing to tell me I was wrong over and over and over. And the more you know me, the more you I love being told I'm wrong as long as you can tell me why I'm wrong. Right. Like, I love it. Like, I look for it. I seek it out. I, it's like, it is everything to me because it allows me to find blind spots that I don't know I have. Um, so I, I really do. I, I, I seek it out. And I, I want to be as sharp as possible. And the only way to get sharpened is with, you know, putting yourself up against a hard object, right? And really grinding yourself down. That's how you sharpen things. So it hurts. Um, but for me, I've just, I don't know. I, it's, it's something that I, I seek out. I love it. So the example that you gave us on how you and 300 um, actively and animately discuss different opposing ideas, <laughs> is that an example of how you manage and implement change? Yeah. Um, for the most part, like I bring things to, he's my no man. Uh, he's somebody that I know is going to say no to me immediately. And so by the, if I can get it through him, then I know the team will be more welcoming to it, right? And so then from there, I bring it to my next no man, right? And then I bring it, by the time it's been, it's been pushed through, it's kind of like I have, like, I have about three no, no men. It's like uh, uh, 300, Lewis, um, and then sometimes Polo. Once I've gotten through those three, um, then it, I start going to the yes men. And I say, this is now what we've come up with, right? Um, and, uh, and if they... Uh, uh, if they, it's not necessarily that they're yes men. It's more that they are not as willing to disagree for the sake of disagreement, right? <laughs> like, like, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that negatively. I'm just saying, if it is something that is agreeable, they will agree, right? Um, they're not afraid to disagree either because I don't keep people around me that are afraid to disagree. You have to be able to disagree, or you're not in my circle, and so. Um, yeah, that, that would be how we, we approach it. It's, it's, it's legitimately like, like take it to the no men. What do they say? Right. Anybody that comes to me with an idea, Hey, bring it to 300 and he's going to, he's going to immediately shut it down. And if you can't handle him shutting it down, you should not be coming up with this idea in the first place. If, if you cannot handle that, because that is a part of the process. Like when I first created this league concept, this idea of this, everyone told me no. Every person, every, and I say every person, when I mean every person, I mean every single person, whether they were family, whether the, whether it was my wife, my friends, my family, it didn't matter. They all said, this is a bad idea. This is not going to work. But finding out those people, seeking those people out and then figuring out why is it a bad idea? Why won't it work? Right? Because I know the vision. I see the vision. I see that it will work, but how it will work is not always clear, right? So, okay, you're saying it won't work because this, this, and this. Okay, maybe if we change this, this, and this. Okay, you're saying it won't work because this, this, and this, right? And that becomes the creative process of, okay, this is the new thing we're implementing. Here's why. Here's all the reasons that it's going to work. And 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 I've already been through it all. So, so um, when someone approaches and says, oh, you can't do that because this, this, and this, I've heard that a thousand times from a thousand different people, and I know the answer to it now. Let's unpack your strategy, if I can, if I heard yeah. you correctly, of how you manage and implement change within the organization. Somebody comes up with an idea, you send them to 300, mm -hmm. 300, Lewis and Polo kind of edit for you. Mm -hmm. Then you have your yes people you vetted through. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of conversation and dialogue going back and forth, Yes, which means you're getting a lot of different viewpoints Yes, on that same issue. Yep. When it finally gets to you, you're kind of the 
socio social mediator bringing <laughs> the two opposing parts together yep and then you get agreement move forward you implement and then hold accountable so that's would be your strategy for implementing change and implementing change a hundred percent yeah it, it's you know uh it's it's a hundred percent that's it yeah okay so has 300 ever been wrong oh man in a business like this it's really hard 300 has been wrong all the time and he'll tell me that all the time but it's only it's only like it's hard to to wrong or right in the wild wild west is hard to determine right like you shot me because i shot at you or, or whatever like how do you how do you really determine that and that's where we are in this in this uh industry it's like it's very much the wild wild west so even when something goes right it doesn't mean that you did it right right so um yes is the answer I, i've been wrong he's been wrong um but it's really hard to calculate whether or not um, we were wrong i think it's easier for for on his side because when he's gone against me it's panned out exactly how i said it would pan out um uh and so he's like man you you were 100 percent right on that like you know last season we um it used to be that we had set up times in between games of six minutes so you are going from one game to the next game in six minutes and that was like uh it was like and then nine minutes if there was a timeout and um and we were you know going into the next season and i said hey we need that to be two minutes and he's like that's not possible like we can't do that it, it's it's impossible to go from one game to the next game in two minutes you cannot do that it's not going to work you can't do it you know whatever uh, and then all the players went against it because I, I fought with him got it through him and said hey this is what we're doing you know fought with the next person got it through them right all the way through and uh and then we get we get it to the players and every single one of them just loses their mind we can't do it it's not possible you can't go from one game to the next in two minutes and um and then we implement it and everybody loves it <laughs> everybody's like this is the most it's it's so much smoother it's you know it's very possible it's very much more inter interactive and so um so i think that that's a situation where he was wrong but he wasn't wrong about how they would take it i guess now i'd like to if i can unpack your culture from yeah. what i've heard <laughs> It sounds like if I was going to give it a name is civilized confrontation. <laughs> and here's how I mean that. You're not counting who won and who lost. It's a team sport. Mm -hmm. And if we can be ourselves and have the freedom to speak up and express our pros and cons ideas and our exp bring our experience to the table, there's nothing wrong. There's no offense taken in what's said because it's a team sport and we're in it to all win. And you've been able to, I'll say, orchestrate and facilitate that so far. So the confrontation's okay, but just keep it civilized. That would be the grounding foundation or culture. Help me understand if I'm accurate oh, on that. I, I love that. That is, I've never really looked at it that way, but that is 100% it. Like it is, everybody, if, when people join our team, they're, they're always afraid to kind of like speak up or they're afraid to, you know, and a lot of times we have to say like, no, you're the lead. Every, every person is the lead on this. Every person, right? Um, it took me a while to learn, like there has to be a person in charge that, that did, I, I'm not used to that. Like you, I think, I feel like a lot of people should just take charge. Right. But I learned somebody needs to be in charge, but from there, you know, everyone's the lead, like everyone's, trying to make this work everyone's trying to make it happen and so if you have if you're if you see something or you're you know if, if there's a crack put some putty in it right and 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 help and improve and um and step up and hold each other accountable and there's nothing wrong with that and if there is something wrong with that if there is something wrong with holding each other accountable then the person that there that is is feeling wronged needs to get out like they 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 don't belong right um because at the end of the day, everyone, including me, uh, is flawed. Every single person, every person, including me, is flawed. But everybody has something to offer. And though they're not going to do things the way that you may want them to because they offer them in a different way than you, they still have something to offer. And you should recognize that. But that doesn't mean you can't hold each other accountable. Titus, you said just a moment ago that we're all flawed, that you have flaws. Mm-hmm. We come to you today from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 60 miles west of Philadelphia, and I believe you're in Virginia. I am. You may be flawed, but 
how did you manage to get your contract with the Philadelphia Eagles? <laughs> so, man, that's a crazy story. That was that came from just being available, um, being showing up, showing up at the end of the day. Um, we got a, I got a DM from a random person. I'll do the short version. Got a DM mm-hmm. from a random person that had no followers um, on their social media, but I, I respond to everybody, you know. And so I responded and said, "Hey, you know, very nice to meet you. This was, gosh, two years, three years ago, something like that." Um, and I responded, and and it turns out that they uh, had a friend that uh, owned an esports team out in New York, um, and then that person also happened to be the one of the male uh, men for rock nation which is jay-z's company and then that uh they that ended up becoming an introduction where i started working with rock nation and then uh, rock nation introduced me at we were at a uh the nba playoff um uh i'm sorry not the playoffs it was the draft party nba draft party uh and then then i met uh, another person who uh is with the uh, eagles who then was putting together an uh an event for um uh, oh, make a wish, uh, make a wish foundation, um, with the Eagles and the, 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 a lot of the players at the Eagles. And so we put together the event. I have unfortunately couldn't go and, uh, but we work with a lot of NFL teams, a lot of, uh, NBA teams now. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that all of that kind of turned into what it is today. <laughs> Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. It all came from a DM from somebody that had 12 followers. So I, I would say like, if you have time, you know, you eventually you get to a point where you don't have time for that anymore. But w- when you're really trying to build something, like just keep your ear to the ground, uh, you know, to the ground and, and, um, and, and just, you know, be open, be open to talking to people. You just never know what's, what's working in the background. Well, you just gave you an example of building community. Talk to everybody. You never mm-hmm. know what door's going to open from who. And I think one of the things that probably sets you apart is community. Yeah. And your business. Yeah. Tell us how you developed your community. You start out with nothing, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden that blossoms into Philadelphia Eagles, professional sports franchises, et cetera, yeah. and what you have today. How did you start building, and what tools or technology did you use, did you use to build that community? Yeah, it's wild because nobody in the league, in the entire organization outside of Ryan, who was my brother that you know adopted me when I was younger, um, I did I know period before starting this. So it's like, it wasn't like a group of friends. It wasn't like, you know, it was, it was me. I, I, um, met a, uh, I had went out and started like sending a bunch of mass emails to streamers and stuff. Cause I was getting ready to start this and, uh, met a guy named Herb. Um, and, uh, Herb and I, he, he ended up helping out. We did a, um, charity event before opening and, he ended up helping out, and so we uh, put together. Well, he comes on board. If I, it, it turns out this random person that I emailed, I had no idea where he lived. He just lived forty miles away or something like that. And I was like, "What? What are the chances?" That's wild. Like again, this is back to how do you find these people? I, I don't know. Herb um, was just a very, very hard worker. Had just you know graduate or just graduated from uh, some program, but because of COVID, didn't have anywhere to work, um, and was streaming and understood the streaming world and the gaming world and um, and was an amazing Tekken player. And so he really just adopted the vision and came on board, became my first employee and helped me where people would come in. To, we had an, uh, a, a brick and mortar and people would come in and I knew like positioning is everything, just like with uh, the real estate. Like you, you, when, when they come in, you've spent a lot of money to get them there, right? Uh, not that we had, but just go with me here once they're in the building you've spent a lot of money so you have to have something to offer them and if you don't all of that money has gone to waste and so the idea of having all of these different games in a single competition is kind of why that that's that's why that blossomed on top of the fact that the average gamer plays 24 games a year so it was like when they come in we have whatever they whatever they want we have right so so that they can stay right and so we started to kind of build this uh, community of people that just enjoyed gaming and and we'd get them to try other games and and, uh, introduce them to this concept. And that first season we had 14 people show up. We were doing a $10,000. Well, the first one was a thousand dollar competition. We had eight, eight, eight people show up. 
Second one was 14 um, people showed up and it was a $10,000 competition. And I remember at the end of it, um, a lot of people didn't believe there was a whole thing, a whole fiasco. We hired a second employee and that employee was saying that, you know, we were scamming people and we weren't actually going to pay the 10 grand and, you know, all that stuff. And because he worked there, he had legitimacy. So it, it really like, I mean, it was one of the, one of the scariest moments because I felt like, you know, even though we didn't have much, it was like what we built is now kind of being tarnished and, you know, who knows who's believing him. And now this may impact. It was right before we were getting ready to do the finals. And so luckily it had no impact whatsoever, but man, it was, it was, it was definitely a scary moment. And um, yeah, we had 14 people that, that showed up. And I remember that first uh, season, uh, cause again, we had two preseasons, but this was the 10,000, the big one. Um, I remember there was 14 people there and I was, I felt like I had conquered the world. It was like this feeling of like, oh my gosh, I did it. Like, and I know it was like, it's silly cause it's, it, but it's not, it's like these 14 people, I have no idea who these people are, none of them. Right. And somehow they're here and they don't even know what's going on. Like they don't need, because I barely knew what was going on. I barely knew, like I just had, I knew that I had a wheel of games and we were doing a UFC style competition. That's about all I knew. I, all the rules were still in my head. I hadn't written anything down cause I'm extremely disorganized. And so like, but they were there. They believed in whatever it was that I had sold them. And so um, that, to me, I was so thankful for that. And I think that that kept them there so that the next season, all 14 stayed, right? And then the next season, those 14 were there. But not only that, they you know brought in more. And, and then, of course, I did what I said. I did what I said I was going to do. I paid the 10 grand, you know, um, and then we did it again. And we did it again and we did it again. And then it, it started to have this like snowball effect where like by season, I think it was like season five was really the, the like turning point where we started to kind of grow a, a, a team of individuals that were helping me. And, and 300 was the first, I think it might've been season four, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. I know he came season three and then I think it was like season four, season five that he started helping and organizing everything. And then we had rule books and then we had, you know, general rules and game rules and meetings every week and, you know, leadership and, you know, all these different, like, it just, yeah. And, and, and that along with always treating the individuals that were giving me their time, like I appreciated it. Like, and, and I try to keep that alive because when I, anytime I implement something, I'm always thinking about how it impacts the people that are putting their trust in me. And that's what's kept me going is that I understand that not only are the people within, you know, the, you know, thousands of gamers that are in my organization, not only are they depending on me, but not only are they believing in my dream and adopting my dream as theirs, but on top of that, there are millions, if not billions of others that also are relying on me that they don't know it yet they and i don't know it yet and if you think about like like the nba and its impact and the nfl and its impact if imagine if they had never created that how many just tall lanky people would just exist you know and and work at whatever croakers or krogers or what you know what i mean like how many would there be out there just just big guys, just huge guys like, like that just had nothing else going right? And I think that there's a lot of gamers that that have that same future ahead of them if nothing is done about this. If if nobody steps in and creates something sustainable for them, then there'll just be a lot of very smart individuals that are maybe a little bit um that keep up to themselves a little bit, maybe a little bit introverted. Um, that will just exist, you know, and, and they'll be told, oh, get a job in tech or go, you know, get a job in accounting or whatever, um, instead of uh, having uh, a, the, the dream that is professional uh, entertainment. Would I be accurate to say you mentioned that you realize a lot of people have a lot at stake. They're investing in you and uh, you're opening avenues for them. They're opening avenues for you and you don't want to let them down. You don't want to disappoint them. If you want to do a good job, would it be fair to say that also in the back of your mind, if you did actually let them down, you'd have to go back and have that conversation with 300 <laughs> and let him tell you everything? 
<laughs> no, no, that never crosses my mind. If I'm honest, I think like, I, yeah, the the only thing that ever really crosses my mind is just like, you know, I I don't want to let them down, and so I'm I'm so conscious of the moves that I make. I'm so like thankful and, and so thoughtful in the things that I do because I know that that they are they are depending on me and and in such a major way that I can't you know I can't I can't let them down and and they they believe in a dream that they didn't have and that is such a beautiful thing that I just you know I can't help but appreciate they didn't have the dream but they believe in it right and it, it's like it, it, when you really think about that like if you just go to sleep tonight and have a dream and you wake up and you try and convince somebody else to believe in that like that's essentially what happened right and um and so it's just um it's a beautiful thing and the crazy thing is like nobody's like virtually nobody has invested money into this except for me right and and there's a few like um uh friends or or executives that have have put you know you know some dollars into it and stuff but um otherwise it's like it's not even about money it's it's really about people's time energy effort and and you know we're we're doing a raise now and um so there will be money involved too but it's just it's crazy to think like all of this comes from people's belief and people's time and effort and energy not money and so to think about what we've been able to accomplish without money like without like you know of course it costs money but it it's we didn't have some huge thing of funding where you know in 2020 there was billions being put into the gaming industry and we didn't take any of that we didn't have any of that right and so yeah it's just it's, it's interesting it sounds to me as though you've been kind of uh, trained your entire life uh, it didn't come from a lot of money and you were always creating games to entertain and keep people busy and occupied and enjoying themselves so you had some pretty good formative training, whether you knew it or not at the time. And I think that's probably true for all of us. Yeah. You yeah. mentioned also that there was a time where $10,000 was at stake. Somebody was saying, hey, you're not going to pay it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the fear flashed in front of your mind, thinking like this could all evaporate. Tell me about the experiences. Tell me about the emotions that you experienced at that point when you actually were thinking this could all evaporate. Gosh, man. Oh, it was like it felt like the world was crashing and it's crazy to think about now because i knew i had the money so it wasn't even that it was just kind of like even if this impacts one person that one person will walk away and this is i've always felt this way it, it i don't i maybe it's um full of myself but i've always i've always felt like this is such a big opportunity for them, for them. And that's what I'm doing it for. Right. And, and to the fear of somebody walking away from this opportunity for such a stupid reason. And, um, and I experience that a, a lot now where I see people that are just walking away, not recognizing, you know, I, I know it's not for everybody and I, I can appreciate that. Um, but there were people that walked away you know, in other future ones where it was, a, you know, another, you know, $15,000 tournament or 20 and, and now we're doing a million. Right. And, but they walked away from that. So that was, that was the fear. And, and it's like, it makes sense now at that time, it was just full of myself. Like, you know, you know, like, you know, you, you're doing a, it's not a huge tournament, but, but in my head, it's like, they're walking away from their own future potentially because of this. And that was such a heavy burden for me because, I was I was just thinking like did I do enough to keep people here did I do enough did I did I let the wrong person in and not let go of them quick enough did I you know um was there was there did I move too quickly did I there was just so many things that I had never experienced lessons that I had to learn that that I just said I was like I I just never I never want to do this again I never want to let poison through the door again I never want to um uh and it happened you know it it happened after that but but it was it was a lesson that I learned from and that I, I but the feelings, man, it, I I can't explain it other than it just felt like the world was crashing. It felt like and I couldn't tell you why there was that much pressure on it. 
until now. Now I can I can tell you because I knew then what I was gonna do now, um, but I couldn't see it then. And the fact that I couldn't see it but still knew is how I've gotten this far, right? <laughs> I guess. Would you say you may have felt the emotions of fear, uncertainty, doubt, but also anger? Oh yeah, yeah, man. It, it's yeah. I mean, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I doubted in in a, and there's so many times throughout this that I d- doubted in my capability to to lead this team and to be the person that I knew I needed to be. I, I remember the recognition, the recogni- uh, recognizing that I needed to become a CEO because I wasn't. Um, and I started like reading a ton of books and stuff like that. And I, I remember that vividly. And, and that was one of the things that triggered that. It was just that doubt of like, can you even be a CEO? And, um, and I remember that feeling. And then, you know, I remember just that, that trigger that it was like, I have to be a CEO or, or I'm not going to see the things happening that I know can. Um, and that was a weird transition for me because I've just always been the nice guy that wants to let everybody in. But a CEO doesn't do that. So, yeah. Can you remember the moment that that belief changed where you said, I have to be, but <laughs> yeah. also now, now I am a CEO and I feel more confident in my position? Do you remember the moment when that reframing of beliefs took place? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, my wife's going to hate this, but it was the moment I had to fire her. That was, that was the moment that it was like, that was one of the hardest things to do. Um, I had to fire my brother, I had to fire her. Um, and it was like, this isn't a family business, you know, it, it is sure it started, you know, as, as a family business and, you know, it's, it's always, you know, going to be yours. And, um, but if we're going to take this where it needs to go, um, I need people around me that are understanding of where it's going, not where it is. Right. Um, when it started, it was just a family operation. It was just an arcade. It was like, you know, but it, it, as it started to transition into this more corporate thing, it wasn't something that she wanted. She wanted to kind of keep it as, so it isn't, it was a mutual thing, but that was that moment. And, and a lot shifted there. It, there was a lot of like understanding of the type of sacrifice I would have to make, um, who I would have to become. And, uh, yeah. And, and, I'm just thankful that that I was given that that vision. You know, I've been given many visions along the way, and that that was just one of them. Well, congratulations! You've done a very nice. Um, you built a very nice organization. <laughs> Thank you've, you, man. You, if you look back on it, you put the technology together, you put the structure for the community together, you've been able to build the community. You yourself have reframed and matured your beliefs, the emotions. You recognize and have a very nice strategy on how to implement change and create a culture of civilized confrontation. Uh, what's next? What's next for Titus? Where do you go in the future? Man, um, so we are going to take the, the league worldwide. My goal in this uh, league is to get players paid, um, you know, more. I think they... The thing is, gaming is bigger than than movies and music combined, right? So I think gaming stars um, will be and should be paid more than any other entertainment uh, stars. And they, I mean, the viewership on gaming, a lot of the gaming tournaments and stuff, and that's what's just an individual game, right? If we combined all of these communities together for for viewership of fighting game sports, shooting, racing, it would be bigger than any sport. Any sport combined, you could combine them all. There's 3 billion gamers, so, um, and that's bigger than any, any sport combined. All of them combined. So um, what's next is just, just take over. Take over the industry. Um, I think that the industry is ripe for the taking. I think that gaming doesn't really, video games uh, don't have much marketing, and that's kind of the, the path we've taken. We've become a marketing company for video games, and uh, that has a competition on top of it. And So just kind of take over that, build out the sales team, and uh, grow. We just are actually going to announce um, today that uh, we have um, some locations popping up in Africa. So we're going to start that global thing. We got working on Morocco and some other uh, locations as well in South America. And so just keep 
keep pushing. Just keep uh, keep growing and expanding. Congratulations. Uh, Titus, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they do that? Uh, you can go to our website, uh, www.uelesports.com, uelesports.com, or you can email uh, my assistant at info at uelesports.com. And um, yeah, and that, uh, our website has all of our socials and email and everything on it too. Titus, excellent, excellent conversation. I love your story. I love your enthusiasm. And I am sure there's an awful lot of good adventures for you in the future. Love to stay in contact. Talk to you again after you start your next phase. And uh, my best my best to you. You're a tremendous person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And this was, this was an awesome, uh, awesome, awesome interview. So I appreciate it. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.